But for now, Newsroom Africa's William Volko joins us live from Rio de Janeiro. A very good afternoon to you, uh, Vuyo, and I guess good morning from where you are. Take us through what you are going through there and what you're seeing. Well, a short while ago, all the heads of state uh, made their way into the plenary room where, of course, proceedings have just uh, gotten underway. But for a while, we were, of course, um, entertained sometimes, but um, it was the red carpet walks uh, by all heads of state and government. And if you ask me if uh, there was a prize um, uh, for the grandest of entrances, it would be that of uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping who walked in with his security detail, was carrying a briefcase. Uh, everyone else, of course, was uh, on their own. But proceedings have now gotten underway, and the host, uh, President uh, Lula da Silva, uh, is now, has just commenced uh, his speech, signifying, of course, um, the beginning of uh, proceedings. And also, Avuyo, what else can we look forward to? In studio, we're just having a chat with Kolani that after that, uh, one of the first countries to speak will be India. We saw the prime minister there too. I lost you there, Masa, for a second. You don't mind uh, repeating that question? Sure. I was just asking um, what we can expect um, moving forward after this opening by the Brazilian President Lula da Silva um, from the Prime Minister of India. Well, of course, I mean, having been the president of the G20, I mean, for the uh, year went by the issues uh, that were canvassed, how far as the G20 they would have gone in executing the whatever tasks and ambitions um, that uh, they would have had. And of course, with that would come a handover, so to speak, to President Sir Ramaphosa, who's going to take over as uh, the new president of the G20, um, and formally, at least tomorrow. But of course, as from the new year, South Africa will be hosting all 200 or so meetings of the G20 that are going to take place, uh, all the way to uh, when this summit will be held in Johannesburg around this time next year. And that's something we can look forward to as well. Just being there in Rio as well, for your, when you're seeing just the locals who, um, how are they being impacted by the summit? Does it then pump some, um, you know, cash in, into the local economy as well? What can we look forward to from what you're seeing from Brazil being the host this year? Look, I mean, no doubt about it. Summits like these do bring in, you know, all these delegations that come from all these meetings that are going to be held um, over the next year. But also it's going to be a big test um, for all sectors of our society, from civil society, your academics, your intelligentsia, your experts, all the way to the government and business, um, trade unions, everybody is going to have to put shoulder to the wheel. A lot is at stake for um, the country, but also a lot is at stake for the continent. And bear in mind that it's going to be the first time that uh, the G20 summit is going to be held on African soil. Uh, a big uh, task ahead I mean, for the country and, of course, for the continent, bearing in mind also that uh, the AU uh, has now been admitted as a member of uh, the G20. So there, too, lie a lot of opportunities for South Africa and the rest of the continent to set the tone um, for the next uh, G20 summit. 
lot is at stake. I mean, you're talking about issues like climate change. You are talking about uh, the just energy transition. But you're also talking about, I mean, wars. There's a war in the Sudan, as, of course, there is a war in uh, between, I mean, Ukraine and Russia. And, of course, we all know what is happening, I mean, in the Middle East and how South Africa in particular is deeply involved through that ICJ uh, process in the Middle East situation. So all these issues are going to come to the fore and South Africa in particular would have to apply its mind to all the issues that are going to be raised here uh, that are going to define the agenda of the G20 uh, over the next year. So the, from everything that's going to be discussed today all the way to tomorrow, uh, that declaration that will sum up uh, this uh, summit tomorrow is going to set the agenda for the program that's going to uh, unfold immediately this summit is concluded all the way to the summit that will be held um, around this time next year, inclusive, of course, of all 200 or so meetings that are going to take place. Um, over the next year, manner of issues I think of. And speaking of those manner of issues, you mentioning, you know, the various wars as well, looking at Sudan, what's happening in the Middle East, Russia and Ukraine. We, of course, know South Africa's stance, particularly when it comes to Russia and Ukraine and what's going on in the Middle East. Um, do you foresee our positioning with some of those countries who aren't taking the stance that we're taking, such as the U.S., having a bit of a hindrance in our communication and these meetings at all, will it become the big elephant in the room? Well, some say so, or at least suggest so. I remember, I mean, um, the U.S. has just gone into an election and with uh, Donald Trump having taken over um, or, or, or set to become the new president, uh, there's a lot of speculation about how he's going to deal with the situation in the Middle East, how he's going to deal with the uh, Ukraine-Russia situation. Um, so everyone is waiting to see uh, what uh, he is going to say as soon as he assumes or formally assumes the presidency of the United States. States. He's got a very unique, shall we say, relationship with Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin. But of course, there is the China factor. We know uh, what the situation is between China and um, the United States. So how are the conversations that are going to take place or to unfold and the processes that are going to unfold over the next weeks and months going to shape conversations around those um, particular issues. And everyone has been talking about how transactional uh, Donald Trump is in politics, that uh, he, he neither has permanent enemies nor uh, a permanent friend. To him, it's about vested interest, what's in it for him and for his country, or to use his phrase, how does whatever he does and says make America great again? And mind you, the United States is going to take over from South Africa come this time uh, next year when the next um, G20 summit is going to be held. So he's going to have vested interest uh, interests is going to want to ensure that when he takes over he is going to define the agenda of the G20 and make it in his own image so to speak uh, Vuyo, that's a, a very interesting take when it comes to um a, a, a Donald Trump a, 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 and him being here for the first time, it would be the first time ever that Donald Trump is on the African continent. Even in his previous uh, administration, in his previous stint, he was never uh, on the African continent. But I wanted to ask you something about how important, not only for South Africa, but for the African continent that South Africa is going to take over this uh, particular uh, G20 presidency, particularly when you look at the themes, the seven themes, uh, Vuyo, that uh, this South African delegation have put down. The first theme is 
about working towards the aspirations um, of Agenda 2063 of the African Union. And I know that's the framework that, is, uh, uh, that seeks to transform uh, uh, the whole continent into a peaceful, democratic, and uh, some, uh, a, a big powerhouse. Uh, so African countries are looking to South Africa right now to push the African agenda uh, to the rest of the world. Indeed, Kolana, you're right. But if we start uh, where you started, you know, whether we like it or not, fact of the matter is that uh, there is so much interest in things American. When Joe Biden walked in about 30, 45 minutes ago um, or so, I mean, so many of the journalists who are in the media center and it's like, Lit hundreds, if not thousands, um, uh, of them suddenly stood up. We even had a few uh, people clapping, and uh, that's how much interest uh, people tend um, to have in things uh, American. And uh, Donald Trump, being the character uh, that he is, no doubt he is going to generate uh, a lot of interest when, of course, he does descend on Johannesburg. Um, come the next uh, G20 summit. But to your core um, issue, it is, of course, I mean, this is going to be the second year that uh, the African Union is now part of the G20. They are concerted efforts to make sure that their pa the participation is in fact very meaningful. There is Agenda 63, uh, 2063, um, as you say, there's the Afri African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is the pillar of uh, the African Union's um, economic projections, but also economic uh, aspirations. Everybody wants to make that um, the reality. In fact, yesterday, President Cyril Ramaphosa got to um, address a forum of very powerful activists and uh, NGOs, well-funded, but a very significant voice. And he made that clear that if he loses the opportunity that there is with South Africa going to uh, host the next uh, G20 summit, all will be lost. And it's not only about South Africa and the rest of the continent, but it is also about developing economies, uh, but it is also about nations of the South. So a lot on his shoulders and on the shoulders um, uh, of South Africa going um, into next year, as, of course, South Africa gets to host all these meetings that are going to shape the agenda of this um, a particular uh, a forum, which has elevated itself above all this. In fact, there are people who even say that the way the G20 has become powerful often threatens how the United Nations itself tends to function. In other words, where you get significant uh, inroads or victories, I mean, for the world uh, through this forum instead of uh, the United Nations, that then, some people argue, tends to undermine the world body. But I mean, there are all sorts of opinions um, on that. I leave that, you know, to academics and scholars. But as um, people have been telling me over um, the past week, it doesn't matter who does it. The fact of the matter or what becomes important is what happens when people converge, discuss things and have outcomes. That should matter for humanity and for the future of the world. Vuyu, I don't know if where you are, you can see what is happening inside uh, the plenary there in the first session. Around about now, the president uh, would be uh, actually uh, be speaking on the first session. Uh, which is about uh, social inclusion and uh, fighting hunger and poverty. Um, what can we expect him to say about this? Looking at what he had said at the UN General Assembly in New York uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago. In fact, uh, we've had to move out because everyone is now focused on what is happening uh, inside. So we had to walk out of uh, that 
big room where scores of journalists uh, are. So I have no view of what is happening inside where I'm sitting right now. But President Cyril Ramaphosa did say uh, yesterday that as much as we're going to talk about climate, we're going to talk about energy, we have to address the issue of one solidarity with the people of the world who are not as fortunate as people in the developed and even developing world are. So solidarity is going to be one of the key pillars. And he said this unequivocally yesterday uh, when he addressed um, that forum, but also um, the question of peace, but also the question of uh, equality. And he said, if uh, the next year has to achieve anything over and above issues of energy, issues of climate change, development, infrastructure, it is that we have to guarantee the equality of all people around the world, especially the most uh, vulnerable.